Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Gavin Cleesbees, uh, and I am the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I'm happy to welcome all of you uh, to the first MHS Movie Club conversation. Uh, the idea for the Movie Club is that it be somewhat like a book club. Uh, we'll pick a, a movie every month. Uh, people will watch it on their own. And then we will get together and have a discussion. Uh, unlike your average book club, however, uh, we will supply expert historians to help understand and verify the stories told in the movies. Uh, this evening, we'll begin uh, this uh, process with a discussion of the 1989 film Glory. And we're joined by two Civil War historians, as well as a group of reenactors from the 54th Massachusetts uh, Infantry. Infantry. The Massachusetts Historical Society hosts a variety of public programs, seminars, and teacher workshops throughout the course of the year. We also make uh, the amazing resources in our collection, which includes many items related uh, to the Massachusetts history, uh, available to researchers through our reading room. We offer many of these programs for free uh, or at a very modest cost, but we're only able to do this thanks to the support of our members and donors. If you enjoy being a part of the MHS Movie Club, we hope you'll also consider becoming a member of MHS to support our work. Uh, now, before I uh, introduce our conversation leaders, I'd like to touch on a, a couple housekeeping rules. Um, uh, because this is a Zoom meeting rather than a Zoom webinar, you have the choice of leaving your camera on or off. Uh, we do ask if you're uh, on the program that you keep your microphone muted uh, unless you're asking a question uh, so that you can help reduce the background noise. Uh, to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function, uh, which will, you'll find in the reactions button at the bottom of your screen if you're using a PC or a Mac. Um, and uh, just moving on, because this is a meeting rather than a webinar, uh, we have a brief legal statement to make. Uh, which is this event is being recorded and will be streamed, broadcast, or otherwise published in a range of media formats now existing or here and after invented. Uh, if you choose to use your microphone to ask a question or to make a comment during the Q&A and the discussion portion of the event, you will be recorded. You are presumed to consent to the use of your comments and your image in these recordings. If you do not wish to be recorded, please type your question using the chat function and direct it to an MHS staff member. Now, uh, moving on, our conversation will begin uh, with a few remarks from our historians, and we will then uh, open the conversation to questions from everyone. Our historians are uh, Kenneth Sorn Wongfrey Shanalai and Kevin Levin. Uh, Dr. Wongfrey Shanalai is the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia, and prior to coming to MHS was an Associate Professor in the Department of History at Angelo State University in Texas. Kevin Levin uh, is an educator and historian, historian whose research is focused primarily on the Civil War era with a concentration on Civil War memory. He has written or edited three books, including most recently, Searching for Black Confederates, the Civil War's Most Persistent Myth. He earned his master's degree in philosophy from the University of Maryland at College Park and a master's degree in history from the University of Richmond. We are also joined by a number of members of Company A of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Uh, the group was formed as a living history reenactment group in the early 1990s, uh, propelled in large part by the release of Glory. Uh, several of their members are military veterans, uh, and 10 to 15 are active serving soldiers, and another 20 are active or inactive affiliates. So we're uh, honored to have them joining us, and uh, I'm happy to turn this over uh, to Kid and Kevin to start off our conversation. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for coming out uh, on this um, uh, lovely evening here in Boston uh, for this program. I am a huge fan of using uh, history um, or, or fiction to teach history or to get people involved in history. I'm the product of one of these um, uh, cultural phenomena and as a way into history. In high school, we read this book, The Killer Angels, um, of, about the Battle of Gettysburg, a novelized novelization of the Battle of Gettysburg, and that is one of the reasons uh, that I became an historian. Uh, I just have a few remarks to make, and then I'll throw this over to Kevin uh, to, so that uh, he can uh, give us some of his thoughts on the film. Uh, I want to say that I had not seen Glory all the way through in about 18 or 20 years. Now, I taught the film in class, and I discussed portions of it, but this program was great because it gave me the opportunity to sit down and view it again as a single piece. 
And upon viewing it, I'm pretty impressed at how well it has held up after three decades. It remains, in my opinion, one of the best Civil War films ever made. Now, we can quibble about the details and the artistic <laughs> license overall, um, but really the main narrative tells a strong and compelling and pretty accurate story. This is a tight 122 minutes of running time, and the writers and filmmakers certainly needed to condense this complicated story for moviegoers, and they succeeded on many fronts. I have to admit, I was deeply moved by some of the scenes in a way that I did not expect to be. Again, I had talked about the film, I taught the film, I had some familiarity with segments of the film, but the whole experience is still really deeply moving. I have a couple of thoughts then after watching this film that I'd like to mention. We can discuss these in greater detail um, if people are interested in doing so. So first, I was struck by the reference to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and how Shaw suffers from it. I did not remember this uh, from, uh, from the previous viewings of the film a long time ago. Now, this marks the film as a, a post-Vietnam movie. There would have been no real understanding of the psychological trauma of combat during the war itself. Kevin has more recently gone through Shaw's writings, but I do not believe Shaw mentions the theme very often in his letters, and perhaps we should not expect him to have done so given that this was not the culture of the time. The real Robert Gould Shaw was certainly affected by what he witnessed on the battlefield and especially by the loss of so many of his Harvard classmates in the second Massachusetts as well as in the 20th Massachusetts. Uh, but to see this portrayal uh, is, 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 is new to our understanding or to viewers' understandings of the toll of combat in the post-Vietnam period. So in that way, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a marker of the period in which it was created. Second, Glory was revolutionary in how it introduced many Americans for the first time to the role of African Americans in the Civil War. Take Denzel Washington, for example, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role. Um, quote, I knew absolutely nothing. I didn't even know that Blacks fought in the Civil War. The American history classes that I took didn't seem to dwell on that at all. It was inspiring for me. It gave me a lot of energy to continue research and get further and further into it. Civil War films prior to this had mostly been about whites and many had a strong lost cause component to them. And we can talk more about what that means later on if anyone's interested. Glory broke the mold. But I've been struggling to think of other Civil War films since Glory where black soldiers have played a prominent role. They appear in Cold Mountain and Lincoln but not in primary roles. Although that scene from Lincoln where the African-American soldier shows the president that he's memorized the Gettysburg Address is quite moving. So there are a lot of other films out there, Civil War films since, but where are the black soldiers in Civil War films since? Third, besides the emancipation theme, that is the idea that the Civil War was fought to destroy the institution of slavery, I was surprised, as I had forgotten this, that the very, there was a very clear message of brotherhood across races here. Shaw is seen being buried with his soldiers, and that's a clear symbol of this. But there is also dialogue that speaks to this issue. And most prominently, when Rollins, Morgan Freeman's character, breaks up a fight and tells Tripp, Denzel Washington's character, that he has seen whites die by the thousands for the liberation of blacks. Uh, while he's uh, as he's as a grave digger. And this is a clear articulation of this theme of biracial brotherhood. This is, of course, an idealistic message, but I think it is problematic because, quite frankly, most white United States soldiers did not go to war to end slavery. Emancipation became a military tool. Lincoln and others, Grant among them, remained committed to the idea that the nation owed the freed people something after the service of African American soldiers, freedom citizenship, and the right to vote. They remained committed to this after the war, Grant primarily, because Lincoln does not survive that long. But they went into the war, most white Americans did, to preserve the Union and to preserve the Union alone. And the Union that they were preserving was one that supported the institution of slavery. Now, this is a very important issue for people looking at the Civil War to understand, because it then helps to explain what happens when Reconstruction ended and legalized segregation spread its darkness across the land. The movie, however, 
ends rather abruptly. It does not really talk about what happens next, the details of that. What happened to the union? What happened to the service of African-Americans in the armed forces or in American society? The movie does not tell us what happened next. And often what happens next in history is really important. And finally, I just want to say that this gave me, watching this film again also gave me the opportunity to re revisit some of the literature that's been uh, uh, written about the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. And I'm moved by many of the stories from African-American soldiers who were there, who, were fought, who fought in it, who are basically not in the film itself. And I just want, I, I was just moved primarily by, by, by many statements, but this one in particular, this is by Private uh, Charles Reason, and he's one of the casualties at Fort Wagner. Uh, he dies shortly after the battle, uh, but he makes his comment. He says, as soon as the government would take me, I came to fight, not for my country, I never had any, but to gain one. And I think the film captures that spirit. I would be happy to discuss the issues with Kevin and with you, the audience members, as we proceed. But let's go over to Kevin now. Great. Thanks, kid. And uh, unlike you, I have seen this movie, I can't tell you how many times. In fact, earlier today, I decided to watch it again. And I found myself um, just sort of mouthing the script, right? Anticipating what the characters would say uh, to such an extent that my wife you know, got up and left the room. Uh, yes, I can imagine that would be sort of annoying to have to you know, listen to throughout the entire movie. Um, you know, and, and many of the things I'm going to sort of reiterate some of the you know, reinforce some of the points you made, because you've touched on much of what I wanted to say in this sort of introductory uh, section. But I think it's absolutely crucial to understand or to sort of appreciate the, the, the historical context in which this movie was released, going back 30 years. To 1989, and sort of acknowledging the extent to which, and I think you you hit on it, this movie was groundbreaking in terms of its emphasis on what you might call uh, an emancipationist narrative of the war. Certainly, it's not the first Hollywood film to introduce black soldiers. Uh, you can go back to 1965, the tail end of the Civil War centennial, uh, for the movie Shenandoah, starring Jimmy Stewart, and there are some scenes, although. African-Americans certainly were not present in the Shenandoah Valley, as far as I understand. Uh, there are some interesting scenes of interaction between, uh, between Union soldiers and, um, and black and white soldiers um, and Virginians. Um, but, you know, if you sort of jump ahead to the 1980s, I think even as late as the 1980s, it's still very much a lost cause or even reconciliationist narrative. I mean, look at the sort of TV miniseries North and South, uh, which included Patrick Swayze, if so some of you are old enough to remember, uh, Lloyd Bridges, who played Jefferson Davis. Um, this is sort of your traditional, um, you know, family split North and South, brother versus brother. This is the, the Civil War narrative, I think, that most white Americans um, are, grew up with throughout the 20th century. And I think even more importantly, we're comfortable with. This was the narrative that, that sort of functioned as a kind of consensus narrative. It allowed white Americans to rally around the bravery of white soldiers from both sides who fought for their respective causes, but we're not gonna delve much into the messiness of those causes. And of course, the, the, the bigger theme of emancipation, slavery, and the service of roughly 180,000 Black men. Now, one of the reasons why I've seen this movie so many times is because I used it throughout my teaching career. It really is uh, an ideal movie, the perfect movie to use, especially with high school students, if you're trying to get at um, some of the themes that we touch on now in, in the classroom, again, related to emancipation and the service of Black soldiers. But of course, you've got to be very cautious about using a Hollywood movie like Glory or any Hollywood movie. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that I was uh, sort of committed to was focusing my students uh, on that intersection between Hollywood and history and looking at the ways in which uh, quite, quite often um, they just simply don't overlap, right? That there is a gap between the history and Hollywood. And Glory, I think, gives you many of these examples uh, the best one, I think, is, um, is the theme in this movie. And we can talk about this some more because I think it's important. 
uh, the theme of uh, slavery to freedom, you know, a very sort of deeply ingrained narrative um, of seeing the war uh, as one you know, that sort of tracks the story of enslaved people becoming free. That is the emancipationist narrative. Um, and we see this through the 54th and glory, right? The, the, the regiment is portrayed overwhelmingly as fugitive slaves. But this, of course, was just not the case. The vast majority of the men who served in the 54th, first of all, were not from Massachusetts. They were from other northern states, and they were freeborn. Uh, many of them, of course, were laborers, blue collar workers. Some were, many were educated. That is certainly the case. It's one of the reasons why we have uh, so many wonderful newspaper accounts and other accounts, written accounts from the men themselves. But we can talk about uh, why Hollywood chose this kind of narrative, right? And of course, this plays out brilliantly, even though this scene simply did not happen in the whipping of Trip in the middle of the movie. Right, that scene, I think, in many ways sums up what uh, Kevin Jar was was attempting to encapsulate in his in his screenplay uh, in the screenplay itself. Um, and then there's Shaw, right? Um, you know, one of the questions that I think is worth talking about tonight is what was he fighting for? What was um, what was Shaw? How did he frame the war? Uh, to what extent do we see Shaw evolve over the course of the you know, relatively few months that he was in command of the 54th, uh, roughly from February to, uh, to July, although the movie, of course, plays with the time sequence here. Um, and I think one of the problems the movie faces and, and that I'm trying to sort of delve into in the biography that I'm writing of Shaw is that Shaw spent the vast majority of his time in the second Massachusetts, right? From June of 61 through February of 63. And that's the place where he really uh, evolves into someone, uh, into that colonel who takes command of the 54th, how, you know, interacting with enslaved people in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, interacting or writing to his parents back home, talking with uh, the officers, uh, you know, in the second Massachusetts that he was extremely close to. So understanding the way the, the war itself shaped Shaw, which really does not emerge in any significant way um, you know, in the movie, other than, of course, his presence at Antietam, which was perhaps the bloodiest day uh, for Shaw, apart from, of course, the one where he's killed on July 18th. So those are just a few things that stick out in my mind uh, after watching this once again, and I hope we have a chance to, to go into all of this further. So. Thanks, kid. Thank you, Kevin. I think we're going to go to David uh, Henke now uh, to talk about the 54th. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Love, okay. Yeah, I was, I was enjoying that. I could have listened for a while. <laughs> so my name is David Henke. I'm the current commander of Company A of the, uh, uh, let me say, the recreated uh, 54th Massachusetts uh, uh, volunteer infantry regiment, but uh, yeah, we uh, uh, I, I had been doing this uh, and, and living history, and we yes, it is reenacting. We also kind of refer to it as living history. We uh, we, we took the liberty to go ahead and wear uh, the uniform style as well, um, uh, in, in the sense that what we do it's it's a craft, it's, a, it's an art, it, it's an educational tool, and uh, and the members that are going to share some things here, of course, uh, have any number of motivations, but uh, a lot of it is patriotism it is giving back to country and commonwealth still and uh and it is about dedication i'd say almost a professionalism in the sense that uh, what we do we try to portray portray accurately you uniforms we use the equipment we use uh, uh it's all very authentic uh uh the uh the weapons of course are uh, reproduction but uh exactly like the originals and uh, so we you know we, we fire live powder of course and we, we uh Follow the tactics, uh, KC's tactics, or Hardy's tactics from the uh, on the federal side from the Civil War. So anyway, we we uh, re recreate a lot of that. But uh, now all of this hobby wraps up. This is great. It's been going on since you know the the uh, 1960s, and you know with a high uh, uh, heyday or kind of a high uh, high water mark there in the in the 90s and the 2000s, and of course has has receded somewhat for various reasons. Um, 
this is a unique organization in the sense that we're telling what is in effect, a, it's a great American story. Uh, it, it truly is a great army story as a 30 year army veteran. You know, this, this means a lot. It's a part and parcel to uh, the army history. And, and we'll just say that militarily uh, army doctrine is actually written and refers to even the basic soldier's handbook. It talks about how the army is driven by its history. Uh, history is a vital part of the soldier lifestyle. And, uh, and as Americans, we like to think we're unique, exceptional or whatever, but it, it is true in many ways. Uh, in some ways we do have our own unique facets to our story, but it is a great American story that we tell. Uh, and just to wrap up my part here as a, by way of introduction, you know, I had the, the fortune of having done this years ago and different fashions and forms, but to connect here in Massachusetts when uh, uh, I moved here in the early 2000s and uh, found that Company A led at that time by uh, Benny White. Some of you in the community, historical community might be familiar with Benny, uh, but, but Benny had grown up as a young African-American here in, uh, um, in the, the uh, Hyde Park uh, area and, uh, you know, had experienced any number of uh, things growing up, but I think he found himself in the military uh, and, and found a real identity. And then eventually, uh, uh, historically, uh, probably in some ways like Shaw did, it really centered him and, and gave him a mission in some ways. And for, so for Benny and, and a few of the guys that are gonna talk here, it's really become a huge part of their lives, more so than uh, just a hobby. Uh, and, I, and I will just wrap up to say that uh, uh, I also served in the Massachusetts Army National Guard, retired from there just a few years ago, uh, full-time service. And uh, it, was, it was really wonderful to see that we, uh, at one point, uh, the command staff and leadership had made the move to reactivate the 54th Regiment. So the Pentagon uh, or the Department of the Army authorizes uh, states within the National Guard's unit, you know, our commander in chief is the governor, as well as the president. Uh, but as the governor and the adjutant general, the senior officer in the state dictate, uh, they can create and uh, support certain activities in the state. So they actually agreed and got authorization to reactivate the 54th uh, Massachusetts Regiment as the honor guard of the Commonwealth. So it is a, a serving command. We have a direct relationship to the Massachusetts National Guard. There are upwards of 80 to 100 soldiers uh, currently from various uh, military specialties. Uh, but they all uh, participate in the 54th Regiment. They wear an official military badge on their Army uniform, dress blue uniform, that is the 54th the Infantry Bugle. Uh, basically, my, what's on my headgear here with the, uh, with the 54 in it. Uh, and so that's a really unique relationship with the, uh, with the state, and to the extent that last year they actually created a space force within the state militia system. So uh, we are now part of the state militia in a sense as well. So uh, still we make up the state force, uh, part of the state forces. Okay, that said, uh, I'm the commander of the military company. Um, and uh, with the passing, our, our, our good friend and leader and mentor, Benny White had passed away last year. And uh, I, uh, or just, I'm sorry, in 2020, I was able to, uh, we continued on and, and uh, militarily I serve as the commander. We have a first sergeant, we have uh, second Sergeant, Sergeant Pascal, and then uh, Dane Elliott Lewis is the president of our association and also serves as corporal uh, within the ranks there. So, okay, that's, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dane and let him uh, uh, introduce a couple of members that we have with us tonight and, and talk about some of their experiences. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, so again, Dane Elliott Lewis, I have the honor of, of being president of the 54th Mass Company A. Um, I've been reenacting since the mid nineties. I, uh, I grew up just north of New York City. So Civil War history really didn't have much of a presence in that area. Um, I did grow up watching North and South, Blue and the Gray, and probably thumbing through uh, world book encyclopedias to even understand what was, you know, that's probably what piqued my interest in the Civil War, but glory was eye-opening. I had no knowledge of there being a presence of black soldiers in the war. Um, but beyond that, it really, I didn't understand what the opportunities were in living history, what reenacting was until I went to school down South in Atlanta. Uh, I was watching, I believe a Veterans Day parade and saw a bunch of black men in uniform 
And I'm assuming I went to a museum and asked, what was that? Who were those people I saw? It said 54th Mass, what does that mean? And they said, well, they're actually reenactors. These are people who go out, they do parades, they do um, uh, commemorations, they do honor guards, and they do battle reenactments. And I said, that's for me. Um, I'm, I was in school for engineering, but I, I've always had a passion for history. And I said, I want to be a part of that. Going to school in Atlanta, you've got Jonesboro, Battle of Jonesboro. You've got Battle of Nashville right up the road. You've got um, Resaca. You have, obviously, the Battle of Atlanta. So there's tons of Civil War history. Um, I started participating with a local 54th unit, and um, I've been having a ball. You know, I'll admit, I love just going out there and firing powder. You know, the story is, is I have a great passion for this story and what it means for America. But there's a there's a saying you're never too old to have a happy childhood, and uh, reenacting is is feeding that love of going out and just playing war sometimes. So you know, from a, sharing the story, I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants, and so I look at this era as no disrespect to the World War II generation. I see the Civil War generation as really one of the greatest generations in this country for what they did, regardless of what their motivation was, for what they did to, to, to keep this country intact, to end slavery, whether they intended to or not. I, I don't think this would be a place my parents would have been attracted to. I, I don't believe my family would be here if not for them. So um, I remain thankful for um, this generation and, and I love this hobby. And um, so, so thank you for having me. And Joe Zellner. I'd like to introduce Private Joe Zellner, past president of the 54th Mass. Joe, maybe you could uh, introduce yourself. Good evening, folks. I'm Joe Zellner, and uh, I can uh, greatly appreciate many of the things that our president, that Dane, has commented on. And uh, I'll add also that, uh, like his experience, my experience came in uh, 1997 when I was at the uh, centennial commemoration of the uh, unveiling of the Shaw Memorial uh, on Boston Common. And uh, I said, what are they doing here? And by that, the they was the black soldiers on horses, uh, the civilians um, dressing and, and marching. Uh, having been a longtime educator, retired now for secondary school, I'd often taught the Civil War and often taught about uh, the role that Blacks played, but I'd never seen it portrayed in any fashion. And re I'll say regrettably, but regrettably, unless you see it on television, it's not true. It's not real. And uh, I even had the experience at one point of having a student challenge me with no disrespect intended, but just genuine, just genuine disbelief by saying, if that's true, how come I never heard about it before? And he was talking about the role of blacks in the Civil War. Um, I responded more humorously than seriously, but I did eventually get around to giving him a serious response. But the uh, idea of portraying those civilians, those soldiers, those escaped slaves, those runaways, all those people of um, the 1860s, of that era, uh, was very intriguing to me. And I wanted to pay honor to one of the people that actually served. And so as I decided to become a reenactor, I wanted to reenact a real Civil War veteran and I found one by the name of Solomon Pierce. I chose Solomon Pierce because I was looking for someone who would be around my age. And Solomon Pierce was 42 years old when he joined the 54th Mass. And I've done a bunch of research uh, through military records and through census records and uh, visited his um, burial place out in Munson, Massachusetts, which was also his home. And I was very impressed by Solomon Pierce. He and his two sons went to join the regiment and his uh, oldest son died at Fort Wagner. 
So as I've had the uh, opportunity now for some 20, 20, yeah, 21 years uh, to participate, I've gotten much older than Solomon Pierce, but uh, at the same time, I still try to portray a 42-year-old. I don't know that anybody believes it anymore, but um, I live on Solomon Pierce did. But yes, I've appreciated and uh, enjoyed seeing uh, a film such as Glory portray the role of black soldiers during the Civil War. Thank you. Hey, Morgan, you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Morgan Kuberry. Uh, I go by my middle name. That's why it says Jonathan on there. Um, yeah, I have been reenacting for mm, many, many years now. Um, but I only recently got involved with the 54th, and tonight I'm actually wearing an artillery uniform from my old battery, the uh, the 5th Massachusetts Battery, whose guns, cannons, and equipment and things were in glory. They were they were filmed for for the movie, so that's why I wore the wore the the 5th Mass jacket tonight. Um, so Hollywood drums up a lot of reenacting recruits, and then it's a one hand washes the other situation where the reenactment groups then go and provide extras and things for these films so um yeah i don't know i saw the film mm, uh in eighth grade for you know social studies class we we watched it um and then when i was a young 20 something out of college i didn't get tv and i only had six dvds and one of them was glory so i don't know how many times i've seen this now um but uh, yeah, I just rewatched it tonight for the first time in a few years. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say about particularly my motivations. It wouldn't occur to me to do anything other than get dressed up and do historical stuff all the time. Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, so I don't want to I don't want to hold up the, the, the proper discussion of the film too long. Thanks, Morgan. All right. Um, I think we'll um, transition to the next phase. We'll allow some audience members to jump in here with reactions or questions. I see there's already been some discussion in the chat box here about post-traumatic stress disorder in the war. Um, one of the commenters is absolutely right. They would have referred to this as nostalgia or soldier's heart. There was no psychological definition or understanding of it. And they simply believed at the time that this was because soldiers missed home. Uh, and so they tried to keep them busy or that they were uh, people who had um, uh, problems, uh, mental problems that, that, that were causing this. And so there was this, there was this, a, a seeming disconnect between the, the fact that these individuals are in intense combat experiences and then are causing, are, are reacting in this way. Uh, the term uh, of shell shock does not come about until the Great War, World War I, uh, and the British are the ones who start to see this in action. And there's some understanding that uh, a re uh, that that the absorption of shock from artillery shells may be causing all this but really it's not until post world war II uh, Vietnam where there's a real understanding of um, of post traumatic stress disorder that we have today uh, happy to talk more about that uh, but I think uh, Kevin and I also have questions for the audience um, but maybe we've got a question here from Keith should we go to Keith first and then uh, we can come back to discussion questions if we have them. Yeah, and I got mine unmuted, so Steve is here. Okay. Do you want Steve to go first? Let's let's have Steve go first, and we'll come back to Keith. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting program, and I am enjoying myself. I've been a reenactor since 2008, and I was recruited by the late Benny White. Um, I trained with the regiment for about a year before we were off the opportunity to march in the inauguration of President Barack Obama. So that was the high point of my life as far as being a reenactor. <clears throat> but my experience with the 54 started when I was a young man. I was about 10 years old and I had the opportunity to visit the Robert Goose Shaw House in Roxbury on Shelman Avenue. 
my aunt and uncle taught there, the late Elma Lewis and Donnelly Corbin, and he used to teach my sister piano lessons. I would go there with her, and the whole time I spent there, I would see pictures and uh, stories about the 54th and the, gov uh, the governor, Andrew, and the participant. Well, my main thing was that watching black men in battle. I had no idea who these men were. And I didn't find out until later when I was an older young man. These black men were fighting white men. And at this time, I didn't know what the racism was. That was I didn't know there was a separation in the whole situation. But anyway, that brought my enthusiasm. And then later, when I was recruited by Benny White, that brought me a full spiritual journey to be part of the 54th Massachusetts. Thank you. I don't want to be too winded here. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's go to Keith, who has his hand up. Um, thanks, uh, guys, for putting this on and having a film club, MHS. Uh, I wanted to talk a little about the pay disparity that was highlighted in the movie between the um, black soldiers and the white soldiers. And um, although the film only talks about the $13 white soldier monthly pay and the $10 black soldier monthly pay, we also know that there was a $3 uniform or clothing supply disparity as well, that the black soldiers had to take $3 out of their $10 to pay for their uniforms. The white soldiers, on the other hand, and had $3 added to their $13 so that they could uh, buy supplies and so on. Um, I did a little research on this and discovered that it the pay disparity was not completely adjusted until March 3rd of 1865, when Congress finally retroactively um, gave the back pay to all the black soldiers that was due them. I don't know if there's anything else I could, you know about that, that I could learn. So, so go ahead, Kevin. I was just, just going to say that, I mean, this is one of the moments in the film that actually does get something significantly correct. I mean, historically, uh, it's historically accurate to a certain extent. Um, there certainly was a pay de uh, discrepancy, uh, you know, as you described. The timing is the issue for the movie. The movie uses the pay crisis as a way to sort of uh, reinforce this theme of Shaw becoming united with his men. Uh, the problem is the paymaster, as I understand it, didn't show up to camp um, until after Shaw's death at Battery Wagner. So the, the crisis doesn't really kick in until after Shaw is out of the, out of the scene, out of the way, he's, 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 he's dead. Um, it does extend into 1864. Uh, in fact, it's not just the 54th, it's the 55th and other black regiments. Um, there are men who are protesting through various channels. Uh, they are also speaking out in camp. In fact, there's at least one individual in the 55th who is executed as a result of disobeying orders. Um, Congress in the summer of 64, I believe, begins the process of uh, adjusting the pay and, and working, with, uh, work, working with to get them up to speed on their, on their back pay. The other thing to keep in mind is that the men who are protesting, remember they have families back home, and this is alluded to in the movie. This is important um, because, of course, many of these men are not coming from wealthy families. Their families depend on this pay just to make ends meet. Their refusal extends, at least for the 54th and 55th, it, it's also something the governor of Massachusetts tries to get involved in. At one point, he proposes to make up the difference in pay with what the federal government is paying these men, and they still refuse. In other words, if they're not going to get the full pay from the federal government, they're not going to accept any pay, right? So this, of course, doesn't come up in the movie, but that's okay. The movie does... Uh, address this fact. And I think it also, I think, speaks to the larger issue of just racial inequality in America. I think one way to understand this movie is as um, a way to understand a broader civil rights movement in this country, the 54th, 55th, and other units. Uh, this is part of a civil rights struggle, uh, the pay issue specifically. So it's an important thing that you've brought up. 
That's absolutely true. And ironically, it's Massachusetts's junior senator that has a role in this. And, and this goes to the question of how African-American troops are going to be used. Are they going to be used as soldiers or are they going to be primarily used for fatigue duty? So uh, Representative Thaddeus Stevens, um, a radical Republican and abolitionist of Pennsylvania, portrayed by Tommy Lee Jones in the film Lincoln, had advocated uh, to recruit black soldiers and pay them as, um, as, as white soldiers, privates were being paid $13 a month. Um, the bill had, uh, was held up in the Senate by Senator Henry Wilson, again, this, the junior senator from Massachusetts, I, and I'm not quite sure I understand his reasoning, but that basically meant that uh, black soldiers who were brought in were being considered uh, for fatigue duty. And in that case, that's why there was this pay discrepancy uh, on that end. So, there, they, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but sure, go ahead. somebody else, the, the, um, the reason had to do with a, an earlier militia act that authorized paying blacks uh, and, and everyone in a militia at a lower rate of pay. And basically there was a, a political holdout in the, uh, in the war department who was saying that they didn't think they had any specific justification, any act of law that would justify paying black soldiers the full amount of $13 a month. And this was much more pernicious than not paying a private $13 a month because a first sergeant who has a lot more work than a private was also paid $10 a month. They weren't paid any more than a private. Um, and of course, you know, the arguments brought up against this were that black sailors were paid the same and weren't even segregated on their ships. Uh, uh, you wouldn't need a special act of Congress to pay Spaniards or Canary Islanders or anything else the same amount of money. Um, but yeah, that, that was the, uh, the, the, the reasons may have been different, but that was the flimsy legal justification somebody came up with, but they were high enough up in the food chain that it, it yeah, blocked it for years. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Keith. Uh, let's go to uh, Delaney Sieber. Hi, um, this has been very interesting. Thank you. Um, one of the things I really noticed in the film was the, uh, the constant tension between the Irish sergeant and the black soldiers. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that tension. Uh, there's certainly a good deal of concern among uh, the Irish immigrant population in the United States that freed people would leave the South and com come to the North to compete for jobs. Since there was this level of animosity, there's also a political issue in that many Irish immigrants to the United States were uh, supportive of the Democratic Party, which was virulently racist at the time and opposed um, turning the war into a war for emancipation and the use of African-American soldiers. So that's there's a basic economic and political element here to that. Uh, but uh, Kevin, maybe you'll... Um, you have other thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add that first, there was no Irish drill sergeant at Reedville for training. So uh, we can start there. Um, Shaw himself was not the biggest fan of the Irish. If, if you read his, uh, his letters uh, written at the beginning of the Civil War through his, I should say, time with the second, uh, he's not a fan of the Irish. He thinks they're undisciplined, right? And one thing to keep in mind about Shaw as a commander is he was known for being a strict disciplinarian. Uh, and this, of course, would have extended into uh, the training of the men at Reedville in 1863. Uh, I also just want to point out that that image of Reedville and the training of these men in the movie is completely inaccurate. These men lacked nothing uh, during their training. They were uniformed on day one. They were given rifles on day one. They slept in, uh, in barracks uh, from day I one. This, this was John Andrews pet project, right? I mean, this is something he had been calling for since 1861. And so these men lacked really nothing. Um, but the, I think Kid hit sort of the bigger point here. Um, but I think in, in terms of, um, I, I think the movie played that up uh, because of course, I think a lot of moviegoers would have identified with a kind of, uh, that kind of tension, that kind of racial tension. So they went with it. I think Joe had a comment. Yes, just to emphasize that 
they they did have uh, they were quartered in barracks, not tents, as was was portrayed in that scene. And um, Camp Miggs looked nothing like what you saw in the film. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I think Jim Moran is next. Hello, Jim. Um, I guess I, I want to follow up on this, and maybe this is principally to Kevin, but uh, to all of you. Um, do you think this is a historically accurate film, and why or why not? Kevin? I, you know, I mean, that's a good question. That's, that's um, I, I think... I think we have to distinguish between history and Hollywood. I think Hollywood is interested in telling a compelling story. Uh, I think that often when it comes to uh, Hollywood movies that are set in the past that attempt to tell a story from history, I think quite often uh, the rough edges are smoothed over. Um, and I think that's the case when it comes to, to glory. Um, it is a compelling story. It is a story that I think for for many people um, is, um, is one that, you know, leads to further reading. I think that's the most this kind of movie can, can hope for. Um, you know, it's not a movie like, you know, think of some of the really just horrific, uh, you know, Hollywood movies set in history. Um, Gods and Generals. Gods and Generals is a wonderful <laughs> example. That movie is not just historically inaccurate, that movie is a dangerous movie. That movie is just a modern version of the old Confederate lost cause narrative. Um, I think there are problems with glory. I think it's certainly that sort of white savior narrative that, that, uh, that comes through is problematic, especially 30 years later. Um, but I think the way to understand it is as a movie, as a form of entertainment um, that attempts to say something meaningful about the past that um, we should be willing to follow up on if we're really interested in, in better understanding it. So I think it's a really good question you're asking. And I agree. As I said, I'm, uh, as someone who came through history, uh, through fiction, uh, novelization of the past, I think it's a useful tool. Anything is a useful tool. When I, in the, my last years in the classroom, we started having students come in as history majors who had gotten into history because they were playing historic video games. Oh. Uh, and that was just so new to me and just, just so alien. But as I said, whatever gets you to history, I'm all for that. What gets you to learn more. And, and I would just add one more quick point that, that Kevin Jarre, his inspiration for the movie was actually seeing the memorial, the Shaw Memorial, the 54th Memorial, uh, you know, on Beacon Hill. And so I think right off the bat, you know, he is sort of his entry point, right, is, um, is a form of memory, right? Um, not a form of, not an example of critical history, if you will. So, so I think I'm a product of what you're describing, you know, seeing the film, being inspired to start reading the actual histories. I, I don't pretend to be the, you know, a, a strong historian. I, I consider myself an amateur. But at the same time, it, it was so revolutionary in, in the story it was presenting that I, I, I can forgive the mistakes, quite frankly. We have a comment here from Nancy Edmonds who says, we do have to help students discern reliable sources. It's absolutely true. And we welcome you here to the Massachusetts Historical Society where there are many documents relating to the 54th Massachusetts, as well as objects from the regiment, um, including Robert Gould Shaw's two swords. But we also have uh, documentation, letters, diaries, and stories about African-American soldiers in the unit and uh, elsewhere in the war as well. So we, we're certainly happy to welcome students here. Uh, and and just, just real fast, Shaw's uh, letters, his wartime letters are published. They're easily accessible and they are worth reading. Yeah, when I started doing things with the 54th, I got Shaw's letters um, from just public libraries. Uh, you can get most of these things. And uh, Voice of Thunder, which is, there was a wartime correspondent who was named Stevens, I can't think of his first name now. George. Uh, George Stevens. Um, yeah, jo George Stevens wrote for a black newspaper called the Anglo-African. And he went to the seat of war as a war correspondent. And then he came back to join the 54th. 
And then when he was in the field as the 54th, he kept writing back for the newspaper. Um, so you can also read all his editorials and things that he wrote, which if you're interested in the pay dispute, he goes into that in gory detail. And he's, he's making, um, he, he's trying to write a persuasive argument to public opinion about the, about the pay issues and things like that. So he, unfortunately he stops writing right after Wagner. So you don't get much about that. He survives, um, but he, do, he stops his, his correspondence uh, efforts after that. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I've done a lot with, uh, with historical film and things like that. And I, I mean, I would say that Glory is a, one of the most historically accurate films out there. And it rates maybe like a 70% on the accuracy meter. <laughs> It's, the, the, there's a lot of things that they're sort of telescoping together. No, the 54th didn't have those kinds of material goods shortages, um, but doing without necessities was absolutely a common piece of the, you know, they didn't have that at Redville, but they had that on campaign, right? Um, most of them were free people from the North. They weren't escaped slaves, but most of the African-Americans who served in the federal army were escaped slaves, just not in the 54th. So, so there's all these things that they're sort of juggling together that are like right time, wrong place or vice versa sort of stuff in it. Um, but it's, it's pretty accurate as, as movies go, but most movies are well below 50% on the historical accuracy monitor. So I, I don't, I don't know. And, and yeah, the white savior thing is like, well, considering what we had at the time was the lost cause, by, compared to that, it's pretty good, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, because growing up in the 80s, there was, yeah, this whole sense that like, we didn't talk about the slavery, like, unless you watched Roots or something, you would think the Civil War was just this like misunderstanding about tariffs or something like that. Like there, it was vague things about the Constitution were brought up and so on, but unless you had really, really far left-leaning parents or something, you just didn't hear most of this stuff. I mean, you know, it was just, but, but I digress and I don't want to take all the, all the time. Worries. Um, I, Stephen DeVos had his hand up for a little while. Let's go to him. Sure. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you all so, so much for doing this and for what you're doing for the awareness of history, which I, I have great hopes will be reborn and that we can move on from especially things like the lost cause. Uh, secondly, um, I taught a course, uh, a Zoominar for Beacon Hill Seminars this past fall called um, Profiles of Leadership in, in Classic Films. And the third film in our series was Glory. And so from that point of view, I was delighted to see that you're going to be talking about this. Uh, Kevin, your comment about Hollywood versus history is a very interesting one and certainly is correct, except I wouldn't, change, I wouldn't say Hollywood. It's any um, historical fiction is going to change history dramatically. The classic to me is always that Banquo in Macbeth was a sociopathic horror, and yet Shakespeare decided to make him into a hero. Well, you have to ask yourself, when these changes occur from history in making something that is fiction, why did they do it? In the case of Shakespeare, it was that his king, King James I, thought that he was descended from Banquo. So it behooved Shakespeare to say that Banquo was a, to make Banquo into a hero, which he was not. But uh, in, in this particular movie, there are a number of things where changes are made, such as, for example, it's not Trip that, or a character like Trip who decides to tear up the um, bank, uh, to tear up the, 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 the pay vouchers. It's Shaw. In history, Shaw did that. And it's not Shaw who says, uh, who, if, I, if, if the um, flag falls at Fort Wagner, who will pick it up? It's the general who says it, and Shaw says that he will pick it up. Almost all of the changes 
in making the in fictionalizing this, the fictional changes are done, I would maintain to show what the movie to me is really about, which is the growth of leadership in Shaw. And he starts out as this effete, um, privileged young man in the movie. And ultimately, as the movie moves on, he learns to be a leader. And who does he learn to be a leader from? His men. Per Trip, but particularly Rawlins. Um, and in fact, Rawlins keeps pushing him. And if you, to get back to history for a moment, if you think about the relationship between Rawlins and Shaw, it's very similar in many ways to the historical relationship between Frederick Douglass, of course, whose son was, the, was in fact the sergeant major of the 54th, and Abraham Lincoln. They, in the same way that Frederick Douglass advises, pushes Lincoln, similarly, Rawlins teaches Shaw, and Shaw goes on to become a great leader. I think, Stephen, I think in the context of, of the movie, telling a story, it works well. I think you, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think as a, I think as history, however, it falls short. Uh, I think to understand, and I think, you know, one way to make this point is the last thing you see in this movie is the image of St. Gaudens's memorial, right? I mean, it is almost as if the movie wants you to believe that Shaw's transformation was complete. Uh, that he had understood his role as a leader, as someone in the Civil War, as this committed abolitionist. And, you know, I, I simply do not see that in the historical record. Now, of course, that's the thing about history, that we can look at the available evidence and arrive at, at different conclusions, interpret it differently. I see Shaw still as a work in progress. I think he had you know, by July of 63, he had just seen his men in action for the first time a few days before. Um, he was he was working through, I think, the questions and the doubts that he had started with uh, in February of 1863. Now, that's not to minimize uh, his evolution, but I, th I do think we have to be careful about um, wanting to see Shaw as uh, as a as a complete person, as the as something fulfilled. Well, I think he is in the movie in his. But again, that's a difference between history and historical fiction. For sure. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, I, I'm I've given instructions that we're going to have the three people who have their hands up ask their questions, and we're going to try to answer them uh, quickly. So we'll go to Larry, then to Mary, and then to S. Crockett. Uh, if, if you could ask your questions briefly, and then we'll try to address them. Larry, please. Uh, your microphone is muted. There you okay. go. I'm, I'm concerned about how the discussion has drifted toward this being historical fiction and inaccurate. I'm, I'm with Jonathan Cooper in terms of, I think the, the main points, at least, of it are seventy percent accurate? I mean, uh, the the, um, the the raid at, at Darien in Georgia um, as as their first uh, action. The comment by the uh, um, colonel that I shall burn this town. That happened, mm -hmm. and that's documented. And and so many of the other high points, I think, were documented. And uh, may, you know, maybe maybe the interactions between some of the characters in there were, were not historically accurate because maybe they were never documented. But I think the high points in terms of what, what this teaches about the Massachusetts 54th, about the Civil War, about the campaign in the South, were pretty accurate and all the way through. Um, the, the other comment I want to make is, is uh, a comment was made that the, the Massachusetts Historical Society has uh, sword, has um, Shaw's uh, Fort Wagner sword, which they acquired in 2017. Um, they already had his, his Antietam sword. Um, this, the, the story about how the, the Historical Society 
um, acquired the, uh, his um, the Fort Wagner sword is really also a, almost another movie in itself. It was lost to history. When he was killed, he fell down the, into, into the fort. Uh, they, he was thrown into a pit. And, and then burial, a burial detail soldier stripped him of uh, clothing and, and his personal effects. And the sword was lost for, to history for a while. In nineteen in eighteen sixty five, um, a uh, Larry, a, I'm sorry, uh, we. Well, I just want, want to make sure we're, we're slightly over time here already. Um, so if you have a question, uh, we'd love to hear. It's not a question. It's it's just it's a fascinating story, and it's too bad. Uh, it, 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 it there's no time to tell it. We we also welcome folks to listen to our podcast. The second episode is about the discovery of the sword. Um, so that's out now. It's masshist.org slash podcast and it's episode two but it, you're absolutely right it is a story to be told thank you very much larry uh, well let's go to mary if you have a question real quick and then Cro uh, ask crockett yes thank you thank you so much for a very interesting presentation all of you um i i have a question about the emancipation proclamation it's not even mentioned in the movie and oh, i just yes, wondered please. I don't recall it being mentioned, I should say, um, any of that. My question is really, what effect, if any, did it have either on the practical day-to-day -day operation of a particularly of a Black unit like the Mass 54, or, and, or on morale? I mean, did it help? Did it hurt? That, that's a great question. Let's, let's go to S. Crockett first, and then we'll, we'll answer all the questions at once. S. Crockett? Your microphone is muted if you're trying to speak. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, hi, Kevin, Suzanne. Um, <laughs> the um, question is short. The answer would probably be long, but wouldn't, I think the movie would have been enriched if, if Frederick, Douglass, Frederick Douglass's son had been included in the story. That why was, why not? Because of time, I know, but still it, it would have been good. Kevin? I think, uh, Mary, to your question about the Emancipation Proclamation, it's briefly mentioned um, at one point. Uh, it had a profound impact, although unfortunately, I think uh, this is often overlooked. Starting on J January 1st of 1863, it turned every Union regiment into a regiment of liberation. Wherever these regiments moved after January 1st, enslaved people that come into contact with the Union Army are, as a result, freed. Uh, it's certainly, I think, um, you know, for, for those Union soldiers, uh, white Union soldiers who were already committed to ending slavery, already, you know, committed abolitionists, it reinforced, I think, their beliefs and their commitment. Uh, certainly, of course, for others, and perhaps even the vast majority of Union soldiers who are committed to preserving the Union, um, they would have been you know, obviously frustrated. Um, they would have voiced their uh, concerns in any number of ways. But I think also at the same time, many Union soldiers by 1863 viewed emancipation as a means to saving the Union. If that's what it took by 1863, along with the recruitment of Black soldiers, then so be it. I think the mistake to make quite often is to think that once the Emancipation Proclamation comes into play, um, that the war overwhelmingly for people becomes a war to end slavery. And I think for the vast majority of the loyal white citizenry, citizenry in the North, from the beginning until the end, the war is about the preservation of the Union. That is what, for those people, was at stake in, with secession. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Great right. question. Thank you. And the Union is transformed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Absolutely. So, and the service of the African-American troops. I think we're over time. I'm going to turn this over to Kevin. I'm, I'm sorry, not to Kevin, to Gavin. Um, there was a question in the chat about what happens to the 54th after Fort Wagner. And boy, do we have a program for you. Gavin? <laughs> Very good. Thank you, uh, Kid, and thank you all for uh, joining us. I'm sorry, that I, I'm sure we did not get to all of the questions. I'm sure there was a lot more uh, interesting comments and questions uh, to hear. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for joining us. 
uh, and for a, a really uh, great conversation. So um, I hope you all have a, a great evening and I hope you'll join the rest of our uh, film club events uh, as well as checking out some of our other uh, upcoming programs, uh, seminars and, and workshops.